you can see me well, you'll know that I'm a little gnarly under the nostril because we were hiking in Sequoia National Park and I fell on a pine cone. <laughs> My son said to say it was the bear we saw in Texas, but they're not usually that delicate. So today we have with us uh, our e byline team. And I want to say a little about what they do before I introduce Alan and Bill. Um, they are a, a remarkable duo who have come up with a really interesting new concept that I think several of you will find particularly interesting. In summary, um, to quote Alan in an email, email to me, eByline is a digital platform, web and soon mobile, is it mobile That's right. now? That's right. Great. That helps newsrooms find, collaborate, and pay freelancers on a global basis in a cost and time effective way. Also, I think particularly of interest to freelance journalists. And as many of you know, lots of journalists these days are putting their work, live to, work lives together with a number of different elements. And uh, this is a vehicle to help that kind of assembly do a work life. Um, as Alan said, critical to your students, we see ourselves as playing an important role in introducing free freelancers to new assignments and editors by allowing them to create an online profile where they can showcase their unique talents and capabilities. So the team is Bill Mommery, just in my immediate left, who is the CEO and a co-founder. These two are both co-founders. Um, Bill, you were recently Vice President of Advertising at the Venture of County Star, where you manage the interactive and print divisions. Um, and Alan Narciss, who is the COO and co-founder, who was recently Vice President of Strategic Planning and Business Development at Paramount. Before those two positions, they had worked at the LA Times, which is where they met, and presumably came up with, maybe began dreaming of a scheme like this. And then one of those wonderful small world things, I first learned about these guys because I met Alan's wife, who was an Edinburgh grad. And uh, when I heard her last name, I said, do you have any family members in Des Moines? Because Narciss is a big family name in Des Moines. And it turned out, yes, you're a Des Moines native. So we're delighted you're here. And welcome. And take it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I, I think this is on. Um, so I'm just for recording. <laughs> Ah, very good, because I have a loud voice as it is. Um, so thanks for having us today. Um, Alan and I came together, yes, at the LA Times, and, and we were thinking of quite a few things when we uh, put together the byline, one of which was, how could we build technology to help the industry? And if we were to use technology specifically, what would we address? Um, there's lots of areas within the industry that we could choose to focus on. But I think our backgrounds and our experiences suited well to really dive into the economic model and dive into the business side behind content. Um, and I think that that brought us to a, quite a few findings and we'll kind of illustrate that here with the deck and then definitely walk through our model um, and then go through questions and answers. So apologize in advance, the deck got fuzzy. We had some uh, problems with the uh, system here. I think you guys had an outage or, or something. But, most of this is still here. What we, what we looked at was we said, what's going on in the space? So what is happening to traditional media outside of the fact that the web is here, right? There's a simple premise that we all understood 10, 15 years ago, but how do we move on from that and what does that look like? Well, we started with, let's look, look at the revenue streams. If we look at both broadcast and newspaper revenue, they started to slip in what many started to refer to as a death spiral. But what is the death spiral and, and why was it happening? Well, to be a little more detailed, the death spiral as referred to by many was simply the fact that the ad dollars were shrinking, the market was constricting on what was the traditional, for the most part was an oligopoly by traditional media. And as such, it put undue pressure on the cost structure that all media organizations used to have in their, in their environments. So what that means is if the advertisers started to look at the organizations from a different light and realized they had more options, the pressure then was on fixed costs. And where were the biggest fixed costs? Or where were most of those fixed costs associated? They were associated with content positions, with, with content production in general, whether it be the printing press, whether it be the individuals in the newsroom who are producing the content. Alan and I were 
at the LA Times on, on the business side. And what we realized early on was that, well, when we started our careers there, it was latimes.com, and we started off with the kind of new media side. One of the things that was really interesting was that advertisers started to complain because they no longer started to believe that the brand carried the same level of quality content, which a lot of people don't really associate with. They think the ad and the content side are completely separate. And while they are, they're very much dependent on each other. And what was happening was we would talk about the brand and the product and the rich content that we as traditional media employees were offering. And advertisers were starting to say, well, I don't know if that's true anymore because you're starting to make cuts. And those <coughs> cuts may be impacting your quality, or at least they're impacting the perception of quality. And that's starting to even further that death spiral, which says that now companies decided, well, we're going to have to make cuts. And if we cut in positions that are producing this rich content, well, how are we ever going to get back to producing the same level of content, the same level of quality we once did, if we continue that, that cycle? So that's what we started to see happening about eight to 10 years ago. Um, so it's simple to say that the news content operations must streamline the way they do business in order to sustain themselves. Because if the ad dollars are shrinking, and you start to cut your core competency, which is quality content production, then what do you have left? You have a distribution vehicle, maybe. You have a few other assets, maybe. But you don't have the core capacity that you once did if you continue down that road. So we said, well, how could we help? How could we help with technology? And what would that look like if we did? So we said, well, let's look at this from a couple of angles. Let's say that we want to take a look at the cost structure. So what if we could offer media organizations a variable cost model? that allowed them to do business and still produce the same level of quality and the same volume of content that they once did, still reinforce the power of their brand, but do so on a variable basis. <coughs> well, the first thing that comes to mind is working with independent contractors, starting to streamline your workforce, work with different journalists worldwide, and how could you use technology to connect with those people? So that's what we aim to address. So within our product suite, we built a software as a service for media companies. We said, OK, so what if we could provide a virtual newsroom environment for media companies so that they could have a variable cost structure, diversify their spend based on when they wanted to spend the money or whether when, when the demand was there. Right? So an increase in demand, meaning there's a big story, there's an event that you want coverage for. Great, throw all your funds into that event, or at least disproportionately spend on that important event, rather than spending on maybe other things that aren't as important to your consumer, to your reader. And so our software allows you to do that. It allows you to have a flexible model. So within that, we have three components. We have a virtual newsroom that allows you to manage the workflow between freelancers and journalists, both nationally and internationally. We manage the assignment and pitch flow that happens, the communication between editor and journalist. We also manage the media asset when it's completed from the journalist side. They submit it through the platform, and then we help the media companies distribute it into their respective system. So if they have a content management system that's print focused, we distribute the media asset right into it on their behalf. If it's web focused or if it's multimedia, we send it that way. You can work with a variety of moments. So what this does, it streamlines the process, streamlines the cycle, and improves efficiency. The other thing we do is, while we built this newsroom to manage the workflow, which, by the way, include payments back to the freelancer, right? to the journalist, we also added an a la carte syndication model. And we said, what if we could also add a revenue stream to the news side? What if now editorial departments could produce content not only for their readers, but also potentially for other companies who have deemed the demand on their end for their readership is a different type of story? And what if you could sell that story? Right? So what if now my newsroom, and we talked to Melanie early on in the sector, and we were talking to her about it, one of the things we were thinking about was, was there capital coverage and content there that can be that's viable, A, to the rest of the state, and even maybe to the rest of the nation, 
and could it have legs in the right environment? Meaning, could it be sold? Could it be sold a la carte? So could the team in SAC produce that same rich content set for their readers, but also put it into a revenue stream um, for their own department by selling it to other outlets? And if they could, what would that look like? So that's kind of the, the premise here behind eBuyLine, is to say that we take freelancers and independent content producers, and we match that up with a marketplace, much like in iTunes for content, and we allow editors to make those decisions in a variable manner. You no longer have a fixed fee, there's not a monthly subscription, but you go into this environment and you look for content based on the demand of your audience or the demand of your product. So what we're addressing is inefficiency. One of the things we found when we went into newsrooms was that while, of course, traditional media is evolving, everyone's evolving, everyone's evolving around technology, Everyone's evolving around the 24-hour news cycle. It's this fast environment that keeps us pushing and pushing. A lot of the workflow within these environments, though, didn't, couldn't catch up this fast. They couldn't move towards that new 24-hour news cycle, that, that demand that was constant, nonstop. Our software allows you to do that. Um, so, you know, I've kind of thrown a lot of topics out here, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is one big problem that we saw was really inefficiency. It's kind of what I've been describing. It's really about how do we help create more efficiency to improve the model, but improve it from an economic standpoint. Because the quality content is in greater demand than ever before. That was one of the big things I think we talked about early on, which was, okay, what are the gaps? What is, what is what's happening in the marketplace? Well. Content's not, people aren't just tired of, of consuming content. Content's not dying. Many would have you believe that because the economic conditions of the traditional media companies are under siege, and those are very challenging, and they're shifting and changing. But the demand for quality content, I would argue, is greater than ever before. In fact, it's increasing nonstop because of mobile devices and the technology that allows us to kind of satisfy that hunger for information. So that's why we built a system like this wanted to help address that and help meet that demand, but do so in a way that is more economically sound. Yeah, you know, in, in some cases, um, it's not so much about what you, uh, it's about sort of who's the best resource to cover a story. So for example, instead of sort of sending your own reporter uh, to travel across the world, across the country, you can tap into a, a qualified freelancer who's, a, who's an expert at that beat, or tap into another newsroom whether it be a nonprofit or another newspaper or broadcast station, to actually assist. And we, have, we see partnerships arising all across the news space in terms of uh, sharing resources, uh, sharing the reporting duties. So our, our model is really geared towards making those partnerships happen. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the flexibility of the software, is to allow now organizations to make new relationships with both individuals and other companies. Uh, in order to do business. So we're talking a lot about the business model of content. In fact, that's what our organization mostly focuses on. But it's really important to note that that focus stems around the premise that we're dealing with quality content only. One of the things we made a decision on early on is that um, you know, the advent of content farms is not new. Those things have been around for a while. Um, we aim to be an upstream content company. We're a content play at the point of content origination where news really originates. That's what our focus is. It's on news. So it's not so much to commoditize the content and, and buy lots of it for the in-house or about us type of stuff. It's really about how do we market and move news content. So as such, we tried to build also a flexible business model on our end, which is to say that rather than charging you uh, monthly fees, you being the media company, um, we charge a transaction fee. We're an 8% transaction model, and that's the same for everyone. And what that means is, is that now, media companies can use our software in a virtual newsroom environment. They can manage all of their freelance sources. They can manage all of their syndication agreements and arrangements with other syndicators. They can exchange content. They can sell content. And only when they do any buying in our platform do they ever pay a fee. 
So what that means is it's free to sell your content on our platform, completely free. It's free to use our organizational tools to manage the newsroom. It's free to manage non-paying, meaning non-freelance journalists. If I have staffers who I want to use the system, there's zero dollars, there's no transaction, I already pay my staffers. And the only time you pay is when you buy content. So what this means is that freelancers use this entirely free the entire time. So now the journalist gains all these advantages that the companies do, but as individuals, which takes us to kind of our other side of our platform, which is, you know, the freelance side is, is just as much a customer of ours as is the publisher. So we built all this utility for the publisher. We also then took that same utility in that same environment and duplicated it for the freelancer. But we just don't charge any of the journalists. So the journalists get the two-sided benefits. So what happens then as a freelancer? A freelancer never sees the 8%, but the freelancer goes in and now can manage multiple uh, relationships with multiple companies. So you can work for the SAC B, the LA Times, and Time Inc. And you can have five projects in your queue at any time. And now you, the freelancer, have a dashboard that manages those things and tells you when your deadlines are. It helps you walk through and, and, and uh, exchange contracts, sign IC agreements. You no longer have to fax over an ICE agreement if you're a freelancer. That's all self-contained in the environment. You no longer have to invoice a customer because that's automated in digital in the environment as well. All invoices are kept. And most of the time, the journalist sees expedited payment terms, which is something we're constantly pushing for and we're constantly talking to publishers about. Because if their goal is to maintain quality and to keep quality, which we believe it is, then in order to do that, they want to hire the best. And if they want to continue to hire the best, they should pay them not only the wage that, that warrants that quality, but then on top of that, pay them in a timely manner. Right, and just, to, just to add to that, sort of outside of the buy line, the typical freelancer gets paid uh, 30, 60, 90 days after a project is finished. In our system, they get paid typically a week or two weeks after a project is finished. So uh, that adds to the stability of sort of committing to being a, a freelance journalist full time. So. So, you know, when we rolled out the technology, um, we rolled it out last July, and when we rolled it out, we started to get applications. Uh, again, you do need to apply to become a member of the body, because this is only for the quality journalist, the experienced journalist, one who has a body of work, to check the background and clips to ensure that this person is definitely a quality, uh, uh, has a quality background. In addition to that, you can apply to our site, which a lot of folks did, or you can become publisher verified or publisher referred, which means that the SACB or the LA Times can refer you in. When they refer you in, you come in with their stamp, and you're admitted in automatically because we believe they've done their, their due diligence in looking at your background and your clips. So we have over a thousand journalists in the network right now who have experience from Sack B to the LA Times, New York Times, Time Inc., you name it. Pretty much every major publication is covered uh, or somebody has worked for them in some, some time in their career. Um, what this does is it also creates a rich environment for publishers. Because now when you somewhat restrict entry to those who have really taken the time to um, study the craft and get good at the craft and somebody who is a professional body of work, you now have created this very high level um, set of, of, of content producers that really is hard to duplicate because now a publisher can come in and say, wow, well, the LA Times referred this person. That may or may not be good, I don't know, but <laughs> if they deem that to be you know, of value, then great. Then, then this is going to just be another badge and another way for the journalist to be discovered in the time. And just to add to this, there's also ways for editors to basically post open projects to our, our system. So for example, uh, an LA newspaper editor can say, I'm looking for this type of feature in Santa Monica. They can broadcast that to all of our freelancers. So uh, you know, editors always ask us what uh, our freelancers can cover. They can cover features, they can cover breaking news, local, sports, um, a wide range of things. And we're finding that editors are actually using our system to find uh, new sources to cover things. Yeah, I think that's becoming more and more common. We had an example um, in Lubbock, Texas. The Avalanche Journal needed a um, 
needed a reporter to cover a championship baseball game, a high school baseball game. And, you know, set, sent us an email actually saying, hey, could, could you guys help me find a reporter? And by the way, it's 48 hours from now. I was like, wow, okay. Well, our content team is actually there to do that. So not only do they scan all the freelancers in our system, but they actually go through their own respective network and our network both on, on, on boards online and in various uh, groups that they belong to through LinkedIn and other social uh, media. We found somebody in a little over 24 hours who happened to live in the community over, who was a professional journalist who had worked for many publications in the past and who was hanging out and, and, and was available. And we actually, you know, connected this person, invited them in the system, got them on board, and then they were ready to work. So that's just an example of how that might have been more of a manual process for us. But if that person was already in the system, it would have been quite, would have been almost instant uh, research. And stuff like that. Um, so again, just to reiterate, and we'll, 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 we'll kind of wrap it up soon and definitely take questions. Um, you know, we talked a lot about publishers saving time and money. Um, and, and really focusing on a variable cost model, one that meets the demand of the organization, and one that can be an on-demand culture, one that can be instant. So if you need to spend, you need to apply your resources to a specific event, you can because of a flexible opportunity. And then the freelancers. Again, we're working constantly to try to improve the payment structure uh, to receive time and payments for freelancers. So in that case, sometimes we act kind of as a lobby. You know, we're talking to the publishers at the highest level. We're talking about their infrastructure, and we always mention that the benefits of taking care of the journalists and the freelancers along the way are going to be significant if you can give them best practices. Um, we've seen a lot of proof of that. Um, and then, you know, access to the virtual newsroom that gives them basically a way to become more entrepreneurial. It gives journalists the ability to really focus in and say, hey, if I want to do this full time and I want to work for myself, how would I do this? And could I do it? And you can now when you buy one because you have now a profile and you're in an organization and participate in an environment and an ecosystem where editors go. Because they go there and manage the workflow. And you're a part of that workflow as a journalist. Um, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much a, a, a summary of my line. If they want to Great questions. Questions? Thoughts? Hi, I have two questions. The first is, so is it eBottom that's setting the prices for everything, or how do you guys go about doing that? Great, great question. Um, eBottom does not set any prices. We allow the ecosystem to manage itself. We want it to be an environment where buyers and sellers communicate. So if you as a freelancer are offered an assignment from the LA Times, and the assignment is worth $150 offering and pay you, and you deem that to be too low, you can counter offer. So what happens is the LA Times goes in and they click on a feature, an assignment button. The assignment renders a few fields of data that they, they fill out, so they copy and paste the nature of the assignment. When they click submit, it alerts you in your mobile and your email and says, hey, you just received an assignment from the LA Times worth $150. Please go in and accept, decline, or counter offer. You can get to that point, now you're in full control. You can accept the position, you can accept the project, you can counter offer and say, you know, for this length and for this much time, I really would need X. Um, and then once once you're in agreement, the two parties are in agreement, and you click accept, you'll be presented with their terms and conditions, which is their independent contractor agreement, their work for hire. When you read that and you click accept, we actually take a digital signature and scan it. So now both parties are locked up, and they have to pay you for that service, and you have to deliver your product. Thank you. And sure. um, my second question is, so for freelance content producers that have a product that they're willing to submit, are the publishers or the buyers like seeing a preview of it, or is it like fully displayable to anybody who wants to purchase it, or how do you kind of protect your work from someone who might, you know? Kind of yeah, so, you know, just like in the, the real world where you sort of send a pitch via email, you know, you're sort of trusting the editor to, to do the right thing with your content, your idea. And our system basically works in the same the same way. It's a closed system. Only editors that we've vetted and onboarded have access to your ideas and your content. Um, so we're able to track who's seen it um, and sort of protecting that, that way. And your pitch can be exclusive. Right. So you're, 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 you're pitching exclusively to the editor. So now nobody else sees it in the time. 
besides this sort of pre-vetting that you do, do you, do you manage reputation any other kind of way? Like if someone were to produce something awesome, does that person then get a, you know, there, was there a way for the paper to then give that person a recommendation? Or is there any kind of rep reputation economy going on within the system? Yeah, it's a great question. We've talked a lot about this. Um, what we're what we're adding now, so the short answer is no, at this point, no. Um, but what's in development right now, what we're adding is a feature that within the publication, editors can share uh, the importance of or the success of project X, Y, and uh, person X, Y, and Z, right? So the reputation, as you said. So if I say, hey, you know, Alan did a great job on this piece, my comments will be viewable only inside my organization, which then allows you, though, to be discovered by one of the other editors within the organization. Um, one of the things we, we do, are looking at, though, is within the profile of each freelancer, showing how much work they're doing in the system. That way, too, that's kind of a badge of, of, of reputation. Wow, this person's being hired, this person's active, doing a lot of work there. They're doing good, right? It's something we're, we're, we're obviously considering and thinking about a lot. We're really sort of concerned about uh, reviews becoming game or actually skewing one way or the other. And that's really important when sort of freelancing is your, your, your key job, your, your sole job. So it's something we'll continue to think about, but at the same time, it's important to protect the reputation of uh, each reporter. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you still do this, but you had been working with some news services whose business model was also changing as their client base couldn't be an all-in subscriber the way they had once been, right? I think yeah. the scripts or something like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, both um, it is. Uh, in fact, we're expanding in that area. Can um, you so a little bit about how that line works? Sure, sure. So um, essentially, we refer to them as supplemental wires. Most of them are the supplemental wires who come in. So the Gatehouse Media, EW Scripts Wire Service. What's been happening, as we all know, um, historically, is that the subscription model has been kind of under siege. Folks are canceling, and it's very difficult to get back up line item budget that was removed once you cancel it in the organization. So as such, what we're doing is we're offering those supplementals the opportunity to get back those customers in an all-in-cart fashion. So now they can introduce both a subscription model and an all-in-cart marketplace so that if their previous customers were interested in the content, but they want to pick and choose and they want the flexibility, they can then get exposed to our platform via uh, the all-in-cart. And how do the wire services feel about that? It's, uh... <laughs> Well, they're well, they're they're signing on with us. It's something they have to do. Um, I would say that I, I think maybe the obvious one is cannibalization. That's the first concern, right? So people who've been in a subscription model the first place, right. wow, I'm going to cannibalize all my existing. However, I think you're seeing a balance though, where folks are realizing that if it's not growing, <coughs> the subscription model is not growing, then eventually it's going to fade away. It's going to be much like classified to it. So we're getting a lot of folks who are telling us that, you know, I want to try this a la carte. I may select certain pieces, put in the a la carte way, others that are available subscription, or I'll focus in on marketing now myself a la carte and work on a volume plan. I mean, that's really, really it. But it's definitely, um, it's not quite religious, but it's close, where there's people who just kind of subscribe to, to either side. And when you're talking about uh, sort of supplemental, sort of not the, not the, uh, the highest volume uh, wire services, this really allows them to go after a smaller market or a market they could reach before who are looking for lots of choice in terms of wire options They can't commit to an annual subscription with just one. So for the smaller wire services, it really gives them a chance to reach a market. And, and do they market their offerings on your platform? Or do they, have they, they do, and we're definitely expanding that as well. Um, yeah. So Yeah, in fact, um, uh, with Gatehouse, their plans and their vision more long-term is to not only promote it themselves, but with us together, we're kind of co-branding marketing efforts. So you see their all the marketplace powered by the bot and that type of thing. Um, so then when they go to trade shows and they're working on the syndication side, they just offer us as an engine, really just an engine that powers that mm -hmm. service. Curious if you could talk a little bit about what you see as the success and sustainability of your business model, in particular, um, you know, how many publishers do you ultimately want in the system and how many freelancers? Is this going to be, you know, limited or do you want to you know, get everyone involved? Great question. Um, I'll start. And yeah. Add yeah. Another. There's a lot, there's so many things we can say. That. Right. Um, how many publishers do we want in the system? Um, I, I think what we look at is the market size. Um, if you just look at content expenditures for the newspaper companies alone, 
about nine billion dollars was spent producing content, just on content position, uh, content positions. So as such, we we definitely think that there's a big opportunity there. Um, it's not so much a magic number of publisher counts as it is getting a percentage in the marketplace to really adopt the virtual newsroom concept. Because once that, what they're adopting is automation. Once they adopt automation, then the rest of the platform starts to generate benefits for the others, meaning journalists, freelancers, um, and then the companies themselves start to save money and then we can quickly expand. Um, you know, as far as uh, the other areas of our company, and then I'll, I'll let you add color here. Uh, you know, we're looking at the custom publishing space a lot, uh, working with, you know, folks who produce, you know, rich content sets, but that are kind of very niche. So, um, you know, the AARP has a magazine, American Airlines has a magazine, there are magazines and custom publishing opportunities everywhere that are hiring lots and lots of journalists. And in fact, they're having a problem finding the quality journalists. And we see that as a great opportunity to expose the journalists who've been in the traditional space to these niche spaces and vice versa. Um, yeah, and, and while there's lots of sort of publishers, magazines, broadcast stations, I think the system has to remain somewhat limited so the system remains trusted. By trust, I mean quality publications, quality freelancers, quality rates, um, and people can sort of make a living off of working through e line. So in that way, it has to sort of become limited. Otherwise, it's too much noise in the system for editors to find what they want. Um, so, so you'd see like a freelancer being like an e-byline, e-byline freelancer where they're getting all their work through this one. Yeah, ideally, basically it would be their administrative tool where they're sending out all their invoices, um, managing all their multimedia, managing their taxes, all through e-byline. It's really geared towards journalists, not just in the US, but also uh, internationally. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the summer I was reading through a, a number of reports that all concluded that, that the death spiral uh, uh, was most virulent uh, with local reporting. Uh, and I was wondering if this system could be set up for a community or for an urban area so uh, uh, your ecology then could, could uh, uh, be geared to uh, reversing the spiral. I think you're right about content, but local content is this particular creature and this kind of efficiency of gear to a, a locality would seem to be a useful thing. Yeah, absolutely. We couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that we think this offers, offers is specifically locally is the ability for independent individuals to start organizations. Start a hometown paper now purely digital, or if you'd like to print it, that's fine. But you can start that now, and you can have a staff available to you in your local market. And you can do so quickly. You can discover them on the platform, you can hire them through the platform, and you can start an organization overnight. The other thing we think with communities that's really beneficial is um, you know, understanding where the journalists are in each community. Um, we have a uh, product that is uh, geographically uh, centric to an environment. So basically, you can track where your journalists are in an area and then hire them for, for coverage of news that's breaking maybe that's so down the street or, or from their location. So we're using various um, check-in type of services to do that. Yeah, location-based services are going to become sort of a uh, foundational tool in the system just because of you know what you said in terms of local coverage, local reporters. <coughs> being able to cover breaking news is going to be, going to be much more important. Uh, for the publications that we work with. Um, and it really works well for a local publication that sort of has a lower uh, revenue basis to use more freelancers to, to cover everything that they're, they're looking for and to cover with the quality that they're looking for. Um, so we see that being a, a big focus of ours. So could you expand on that and say a little more about kind of the profile of your publishers? They're everything from a nonprofit like ProPublica to major commercial, but also down to, do you have a lot of sort of web-based, hyper-local, um, yeah, go ahead. yeah, so we range from major metro newspapers, um, but our, our biggest tool would probably be community sized newspapers. So, what would the circulation size? Uh, 50 to 50 to 150 is right. probably the sweet spot of who really, really wants to adopt it right away. Um, of course, the larger organizations, it's it's a um, it's a shift. It's a shift in a lot of different things to, to get that done in a big organization. And so, you know, we do have. Uh, 
stack B on. We do that with the LA Times, their niche division, which is uh, powers about 300 freelancers alone. Um, and uh, we're working with the newsroom on, on a couple of other things. So yeah, it definitely is, is all over the board. Um, but it's a different use case, uh, which is interesting. What we're learning is that the use case for the small paper may not be so much that they're saving so much money, because they may not have had the huge overhead that some of the larger companies did in fixed costs. So what's happening, though, is they like people to be discovering freelancers and to constantly look at new journalists in their community. And so they're using it mostly for that. And then to manage columns. We just submit things through the platform on a regular basis, and they take it very seriously. And in terms of the freelancers, are you a lot stronger in certain geographic communities in the country, or are you stronger in certain interest I, I, I would communities? Say, I would say that we're national now. I, I think we started off being very strong in California, because that's where we're based. And that's where our first publications um, were based. Uh, but now I think that you know we're over a 1,000 freelancers now. Um, small portion actually being international. So I would say that you know north, south, east, west, um, we're pretty much covered. Yeah. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about the what is your organization? You say you have a content team, you know, obviously a software company, so you have you, you do you work on your products. Right. I mean how how many of how many people are you and, and how who's doing what? Right, good question. So um, we have six of us here uh, in the office. We're actually based in Truman Oaks, which is part of the um, and then we have six in Thailand and uh, dev team <coughs> excuse me, who are who are constantly working on the platform doing all of our programming. Um, and that's actually led by um, our senior developer, who was LA-based, and was here with us, and has since relocated and opened our shop for us. Um, so it allows us to, to really put tight controls on development. Um, but we are now looking at expanding pretty aggressively. Um, so you know, our, our team will triple in the next 12 months. Um, and that's an aggressive growth that is really coming from the demand of of using the platform and of all the new use cases. And as we kind of talked about, you know, use cases for community is slightly different than custom publishing, which is slightly different than major metro. Um, and it's definitely different than magazine. And so each one of those use cases provides um, new opportunity for us so we can do this And you know, we always recommend to our, our, our partners that they manage a virtual staff. So we sort of man manage a virtual staff as well. Yeah. So for example, if you look at our blog, it's all sort of populated by freelance journals. We're talking about their trade. Our developers are freelancers. Our web designers are freelancers. Um, so we, we try to be as virtual and as lean and nimble as possible. Uh, just because it makes a lot of sense for a startup, but also you can find really good people who are out there willing to work. So. We've never met our front end design team ever in person. We've never met a few of our developers ever in person because it's a completely independent relationship. And we're nonstop in chat and email and phone and Skype and the whole deal, but you just you know, don't need to be there. We met our attorney twice. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we spent a lot of time with him. Yeah. So, if you look at the result from last year, what kind of story you have, and you know, the length of time, how much it uh, it's been paid, and if you look forward, uh, you kind of move into more collaboration or bigger team and things like that. If you can out out that environment. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Regarding, were you you're referring to the rates that, that people are paying for, this, right. for the and product? And the length of time for each store and things like that. Yeah, I would say that um, on average, the price is, it's a, it's a little tough to gauge, but you know, well over uh, $150 right in there is probably a, a, a sweet spot. Because again, because it ranges in sizes of, of stories and, and things like that. The length of time, I would say, the cycle is pretty much a weekly basis cycle, a weekly cycle. Yeah, that's right. right. We, we so, get a half around that sort of. For one person. Yeah, for one story, one project. Yeah, not too many six month out uh, type of, of contracting going on, lots of week to week. Mm -hmm. um, which also tells us there's a lot of uh, uh, subsidizing of the existing workforce. Maybe they were forced to make cuts in certain areas and they long, no longer can cover things on their own. Mm -hmm. So then they, they look to freelancers right away. Yeah, it's like Bill said, you know, the, the use cases it varies between publishers. Some are only feature based, so they're focused on travel stories and back to school and sports stories, and those tend to be longer. But the majority is really sort of local stories. Um, so local events, and those are a week, week and a half uh, in typical range. But you're not going to offer any kind of collaboration project or anything like that at all? We're, we're actually oh, considering, multiple, uh, yeah, multiple yeah. freelancers, right. multiple editors. Um, that's something that we're definitely working on, because a lot of the nonprofits that we're, we're partnering with, um, that's important to them. 
Um, so, uh, absolutely. Right. Yeah, folks like Spot Us who are constantly looking for different people, you know, they're on the platform as well, looking for other avenues to either get the stories, purchase stories, or find new relationships to work with. Doesn't that, that like so. get complicated with Spot Us, which has their own pay model? Or are you just they, sort they, of they have a pay model, but they don't necessarily have a distribution model. Right. And that's where we come in. Actually finding uh, publishers to actually run the stories or right. show interest for distribution, whether that be exclusive or, or a multi-publisher. Melanie, I wonder if you could talk about, that you all know this is Melanie Silva was, you mentioned this bill, editor of the Sacramento Bee, and now is with us uh, for a semester, looking at connecting journalism and community. What was it like for you as a, a client or partner? Yeah, I think we saw one of the first demos. I you? think you were, you were early on, yeah, early in. It was, a, it was agonizingly slow to move through all the things, all the hoops that we had to go through internally. But it is in place now, kind of, got people trained up and I don't I don't know how it's being used but the promise that that we saw was one it's a lot easier you know using freelancers across the paper in a lot of different departments and billing invoicing is always you know pain you're dealing with accounting people not getting paid so the, the efficiency appealed to us being able to find new freelancers appealed to us being able to kind of do the conversation electronically about the pitch and the story and editing and so on. Um, there are some things in Cal as California especially but with the Labor Department I think I need to add a little on that. Uh, there's a lot of rules about dealing with contractors and you know about directing work. So in other words you know it, it's problematic to use freelancers and say we want you to go cover this at this time and so on and so forth. So there's there's some of that. So we had to work through all those HR, legal, accounting, that's it. But, um, but I think it is uh, really promising. And one question I wanted to ask, because I know you have some competition, so who is, who is your main competition? Um, well, there's, there's nobody no doing exactly what you're doing. Yeah, there's you. nobody doing exactly what we're doing. Right. Um, you know, that's not to say there won't be. Uh, right. Competition is likely and in most cases will happen at all all business sectors. Um, but nobody's doing the mixture of what we're doing with freelancers mm -hmm. and the cost containment and the marketplace. Um, and then the idea that you can uh, actually handle the transaction as well, which is the flow of currency back and forth. Um, that's also a big differentiator for us. So there's lots of different um, companies out there looking at a la carte marketplaces. Mm -hmm. There's lots of companies uh, who are looking at the freelance space from a brokering or uh, an agency or rep firm type environment. Mm -hmm. um, but we're the only one that really kind of uh, combines the two. And then what we add to it is the ability to then manage the, the taxes on one side and the payment flow. Um, you know, we're working with, you know, working in different currencies or international. I mean, there's just so many different avenues there. So it's hard to say. I think everybody's in this space is looking at it either from a syndication standpoint or from a freelance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our challenge is to look at them both because we think they're actually integrated. And, and Scripps is a big investor, it's a major investor. Yes, Scripps led our Series A round in November, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're looking to close another round soon that um, we haven't yet made public, but in the next few weeks we'll be getting another um, kind of fusion of capital that will really help our company grow at really the levels that I was referring to. Can you say how much you've grown so far? Uh, how much? I'm sorry, how much you've raised so far? Uh, yeah, we can say we've raised um, 1.65. 1. Sorry, 1.65 we've raised so far, and um, that was from our first Series A round, and then an uh, LA area angel based round prior to that to build a prototype and do things like that. Um, so we did that. In fact, we started the company in 2009. We got together um, around this concept, uh, and then it wasn't until 2010 where we finished the prototype and really flushed out the model where we secured our series A. So do you have an idea what 2011 revenues would be? I do, but we don't disclose that right now, but it, it's, it's, it's moving up in the right, right pace. <laughs> <laughs> Did you originally conceive this more as a, you know, you all were inside the LA Times, you saw what was happening in the LA Times and other legacy media. Did you originally think of it as pretty much exclusively a way to help that kind of company continue in a much more difficult environment in which you did believe that people want high quality content and it's now morphed into something broader because of course the marketplace looks so different in terms of who <coughs> wants content and who's producing content? 
Is that yeah. accurate? <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, what we did was, yeah, I think when we were at the Times together, we were constantly talking about, I mean, I think it's just what people do in their company, is talk about ways to improve it, how do I improve this, how do I improve that. Um, and then when we left, you know, uh, it was some of the exposure to media exchanges in general. Um, on the advertising side, there's lots of online media exchanges that came into play. It gave us the idea that, well, what if you could exchange content in a similar fashion to that of the way the ad dollars flow? Um, and I don't know how much you guys have gotten into that space, but it's pretty fascinating on the ad side where ad, ad, advertising online is basically sold like a, any other exchange. It's pretty much akin to the stock market where there's auctioning prices, rented inventory, and things like that. And that's what sparked, well, what if we could do something similar to content and what would that look like? And we started with the idea that there's also this broken, somewhat broken operational problem with freelance handling. It was kind of messy. And so we said, what if we could make that more efficient and offer the exchange um, facts that are the exchange components of what we've seen in the, in the ad side and what we look like? Yeah, I mean, the idea really started with managing freelancers. Um, so, you know, when you read about layoffs of reporters, that's actually a pool that we could tap into. So part of the idea is this, this actually create a mechanism in the marketplace for these folks to get work. But to actually make the product viable um, in terms of having a newspaper or a magazine interested in uh, using it, there's lots of other features we had to develop. Uh, so for example, freelance management translates into syndication and tax management and content management systems um, and all those different things, security. Um, uh, IC agreements. All these different things sort of became features to make the product viable. So uh, it, it evolved over time. Um, and um, it's continuing you know, it, Exactly. So the product's going to be a lot different next year as well, uh, based on sort of breaking news and international and uh, all sorts of different features that we have our eye on. So. With over a thousand uh, freelance journalists in your network or in your system, can you talk a little bit about how you first targeted or recruited? these freelancers with, you know, like the high quality work of journalism mm -hmm. to, to join? The, the first way we, uh, we sort of have a, a process for this, and the first way we, we did that is actually getting publishers to use the system. Um, as publishers use the system, their editors invited their trusted freelancers, who in turn invited other freelancers. So it really started with the vetting of the editors that we trusted vetting other freelancers. And then we've done some sort of uh, soft marketing um, we're definitely going to be expanding that in the next year, but it's really sort of starting with an editor and their relationship with the freelancer. Um, and that's, you know, a good 60% of our freelance role, our referrals from, from editors. So would a talented uh, journalism student here who worked for our own news labs and, you know, had some experience in that be able to come aboard? What are the kind of, how do you judge it? Somebody, do they have to be recommended by somebody else? Or? No, they can come in organically, as we call that. Mm -hmm. Um, so a uh, standard freelancer will tell us about their education, where they worked in the past, um, their, their beat, their specialty, what their specific multimedia skills are, because that's becoming more important in our system, whether you can manage video or photography or web produce, any sort of uh, cog in the uh, sort of newsroom uh, ecosystem. Um, and we, bet we look at all those different things. We might actually have a conversation with the freelancer to ask more questions, and then we make a decision. Um, as far as the relationship between like editors and freelancers, when a freelancer uses eByline to, let's say, pitch a story to the New York Times, are they directly in contact with the editor in charge, or is it just the New York Times movies? Like, is there an opportunity for them to pitch them other work outside of the system, or is it from there on they're connected through eByline only? Yeah, so there's, there's two ways. Um, yes, they're connected with the respective editor. Um, you can pitch a publication, and it can go to all the editors if you are favorited by those editors. So the way we did this was to avoid to avoid kind of a spamming effect for the editors and then improve their experience. We wanted, we're constantly pushing in front of them the profiles of individuals that match their, their, their interests or their needs. And based on that, they'll elect a favorite, a freelancer or two or three, as many as they want, and the favorites appear on a dashboard. Mm -hmm. Any of those favorites can direct contact to the editor on a long basis if they, if they want it. Um, otherwise, yes, then they have to actually be a process so that they're not, there's a slight wall in there. Yeah, so it's not a scam. You know, we wanted to create a separation somewhat for an editor between their email and sort of using eByline to actually push projects along. So uh, we really wanted them to only be contacted through eByline 
uh, where they sort of have stamped the relationship and said, yes, I want this freelance review to contact me. And the idea behind that is these pitches are sort of my most important pitches um, that I want to get through. And then I can go through my other pitches um, at a later time. So. If we have no other questions, then join me in thanking these guys. <laughs>